One of the biggest conversations we've had in the last few days has to do with whether or not to reshuffle. There are growing calls for the president to reshuffle his government, his ministers. The president had a verdict last few days, which has prompted us to have a bigger conversation. So we're going to talk about reshuffling government at the time of crisis. What are the basics? And I'll explain to you quickly what we mean by the basics. Now, let's just go through a few things. When it comes to right now where we are, the president started off his first term, as you remember, with 126 ministers. The, one of the, it's unprecedented. But he had a reason. We'll come to his reasons for this. And then in second term, this number reduced to 86. That is his, it's in his second term. So there's this huge government he was already running. But this was his reason back in 2017. It says, quote, it is a necessary investment to make for the rapid transformation of this country. So that was the president's own reason for having this huge size of government. The question to ask now where we are currently is does the current number and the current composition justify, um, does it bear him out? What he says here is a necessary statement to make for a rapid transformation of this country. Have you seen that rapid transformation that the president was saying, listen, is the reason why I have the huge numbers. I trust in them because they're going to bring us rapid transformation. In fact, the president also went ahead to say that, the, in essence, the end will justify the means. Says, I'm the man in the hurry. Do you remember those words? And I believe it is this government, the size, will deliver. And so judge, you remember him saying that, judge the outcome. Let you focus on the outcome. And the outcome will justify the number. The question to ask tonight is, You've seen part of the outcome tonight. Does that justify the numbers we have? He said, I still trust that core team. And he gave a verdict um, a few days back. But there's something else he's done, though, in his, uh, in his first and second terms. If you look at the ministries, right, that he has, he, according to the presidency on the website, he had 36 ministries. Second term reduced to 28. He had re realigned seven of them and abolished one. The, these were the realigned ones, right? We have the aviation ministry, business development, inner city zongo development, men, uh, the monitoring and evaluation. That is a very important one, remember that. That was brought in, we're told, to keep the ministers on their toes. And that the monitoring and evaluation, I remember doing an interview with the minister who was in charge then, and he said that was going to be one of the bases, his report. Dr. Antonio Kutose, he told me that his reports would inform the president at cabinet when it comes to decision whether to reshuffle, take some out, and bring new ones in. That ministry is no longer there, but it begs the question, the president's first term, he, he didn't reshuffle. And it rarely happened in the Fourth Republic for a president to go through the entire first term and do very little minor reshuffle. So the question is, is it that in that first four years, Dr. Antonio Couture says monitoring and evaluation of these ministers came out with Sterling A. Um, all the time, saying they were do all doing well, for which reason the president kept all of them. That ministry is even more needed today, um, but isn't there anymore. But I, I must argue that I think the people of the republic are the ultimate monitors and evaluators of this current government. And we'll tell you a poll we ran just before the show, just to try and sample what you are thinking along the right lines of reshuffle or not, to see if your monitoring and evaluation will lead to a verdict of a reshuffle. And we, we also saw a reorganization and development ministry that we know had been realigned, Special Development Initiative to gone. He abolished the office of the senior minister. Uh, according to the president, all these special purpose ministries have achieved their purpose, uh, purposes for which they were established in 2017. This was in 2021 after he won a second term, uh, giving him sort of assessing his own last four years. And he says, this is they've achieved their uh, aim. Now, you come to the new kid on the block, which is the Minister for Public Enterprises, it's, and, and that also was established to try and, you know, beef up the public enterprises. So the present on the reshuffle question was an interesting one. And let's go back and understand where this reshuffle conversation came from. The first organized attempt to get the president to reshuffle, I say organized, came from within the MPP's own ranks. There's a group that has been formed of the MPP foot soldiers. It's an alliance of MPP foot soldiers. On Facebook, they have a membership of 5,000 people. They held a press conference, and many of them 
are activists of the party. They held a press conference asking the president to reshuffle his government. And their reason was simple. Because of the current economic challenges, they believe fresh minds will bring new ideas that could then um, restore hope and bring confidence back and get the get Ghanaians back uh, in the president's, on the president's side going forward. That was the first organized demand. And that was last week. We've had individuals making those same calls. Uh, remove the, 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 the finance minister has been one, but organized, it came from within the party. But the president had an answer to all that. One of the things he said is that, and this is the president's verdict, is that his ministers have been outstanding. This was just speaking 48 hours ago in the northern region. It says the NDC had made calls too, and that their calls is to destabilize the government. In fact, his point is, others who are making the calls, they are jobless, they want jobs. And that is why the call is being made. But this outstanding bid is, is the key thing. So the president is saying, after six years, in seven years in government, six years, six years plus, almost seven years in government, my ministers have been outstanding, right? In the second term, they have been. Do you agree with him? We'll come to my guests shortly. So we need to ask the question. So if this is the president's rating of his ministers, what, what do the indicators say? The indicators that anybody will use to judge a government's performance, what really do they say? Do they you know, you know, give the president approval of the president's own rating? One of the first things you look at, and we've seen that recently, what the International Ratings Agency are saying about your economy. Because they will really look hard at you and tell you what, what it is that is happening in your economy. When he came in, Moody's had us at B minus in 2016. Now, junk state was three, six, triple C in 2022. S&P had us at B minus in 2017 when he came in. Now we are triple C plus again. Same junk status. Fitch, obviously, we saw that happen um, you know, today. B, then in 2017, again, triple C. So if you're taking just the rating agency's verdict on us, they will disagree that the performance has been outstanding. That's one. And then you also look at the other indicators. I'm, I'm using economic indicators because of the current circumstances we are in in the economy. Inflation was 12.4%. Now we are 31.7%. Um, exchange rate, you know, one is to four CD, uh, 42 pesos when he came in. Now we are at eight CD, 82 pesos. And this, by the way, is Bank of Ghana telling us this. If you go to the market, um, you find it, you know, some even quoting up after nine, right? More than nine CDs. Import cover, it used to be 4.3 uh, months import cover. Now we have 3.4 months import cover. Debt to GDP ratio was 68.7 when, when it came in. Now it's 78.3%. So if you're using economic indicators, they will, that will show that there's a disagreement there with what the president says about the outstanding nature. So what, did, what do you say? Then, therefore, having seen some of the indicators, should there be a reshuffle or not? We put up a poll um, on our social media pages, and this is a Joy News one, and it is on Twitter. Should the president reshuffle his ministers? And yes or no simply is what's, what you're supposed to tell us. If you look at, if you look at it closely, you'll find that reshuffle is 88.4%. 88.4% of you tell us that the president should reshuffle. Only 11.6% of you say he should not reshuffle. So for that, you know, social media poll, we, we are not saying it's scientific. It just gives you a sense of what people are thinking along this. And then there's a second poll uh, we did, which is the question about the president's own verdict, right? We asked, do you agree with the president's own, do you agree with the president on his ministers being outstanding when he said they are outstanding? Do you agree? Um, yes. Is 8.2% 8 say they agree with the president's assessment? No. 91.8% said no, they, they disagree with the president. So this is just giving you a sense of what members of the public are thinking as reflected in the social media poll. My guests are joining me. One of the things we'll do tonight, and they know this, some of them have been there close to government. They've you know, taken decisions to reshuffle before. It's about the, the governance relevance of a reshuffle. And I, I want to open up the conversation a bit more. 
What do you consider in reshuffling? Is there a correlation between a reshuffle and the government performance? Is there automatic that the president reshuffles, somehow, all of a sudden, will have better plans to solve our current economic crisis? And what do you consider in doing so? And do they agree that the current economic circumstances requires a reshuffle? Franklin Kujo is my guest. He's in the studio with me. Also joining us uh, is a former Chief of Staff. We have two Chief of Staffs. One served under President Kufo, um, himself the overall boss, that's in Kujo Pini, who join us via Zoom. And then we have a, a second Chief of Staff. He was a Deputy Chief of Staff under uh, former President Mills, a, a good friend of mine, long time no see indeed. Uh, Alex Segbefia uh, is joining me. Hello, Alex. Long time no see. I like your beard. What happened to the beard? You, you look um, angelic with, with the beard. <laughs> I, I'm protesting the economy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll hear Alex's view. Alex was a deputy chief of staff. Oh, and, and that's uh, another good friend of mine, uh, Professor Bafo Ejimendria. And he is going to give us the governance side of this. I really wonder, what, is, it, is, it, is it a governance tool um, that you can deploy a reshuffle? And really, the, let's call it the anatomy of a reshuffle. Um, what is it, really? He'll give us his thoughts. Um, when we return from this quick break. I'm looking forward to this conversation. These people know what they're doing. Imani, I must mention, used to rate the ministries. And so they have some basic mechanisms and variables that they've looked at they've, in their past issuing very controversial reports anytime they did. I want to tap into that. And that's why Franklin is here. Join me after the break. Okay. Thank you for staying with us um, on PM Express. As I said earlier, my guest is... Uh, Franklin Kujo is the president of Imani Africa. He's in the studio with me. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing his thoughts. As you know, uh, they have this very interesting report that they used to release. And so they've developed the uh, variables and factors already that, you know, used to value the ministry. So I'll tap into that. Also joining me is Alex Segbefia, former deputy chief of staff. Uh, and if you know what the chief of staffs do, um, they are the chiefs of staff. As simple as that. The meaning is in their name. And so I want to tap into that. He himself became a minister uh, later. I wonder if he was ever reshuffled, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask him when we, when we talk. And then uh, Professor Bafo Ejimendia is also joining me, um, and he's, of course, you know him, um, governance uh, think tank when it comes to that. He's running, he's been there, the UN, and all. I'm grateful that he could join us with his thoughts. And then we have the uh, former chief of staff under um, and President Kufo, um, uh, Mr. Koju Pini. Is Mr. Koju Pini with us on the phone? On Zoom. Oh, um, Mr. Kujo Pini, I'm grateful that you could join us also. Um, I'm delighted to have you joining us uh, on Zoom uh, tonight. I want to start with a basic question uh, and, and, and with a, hopefully a brief answer, just to set the basis for the conversation. Frank, I'll start with you. Uh, where we are right now, is there a justification for a reshuffle? Very briefly, is there, is there a justification for a reshuffle? Yes, there should be a justification. Okay. But of course, it depends. If the president believes that there's a need for policy shift in terms of the challenges we face right now, mm -hmm. challenges that are domestic, domestically driven, mostly, uh, and then those that are induced uh, externally. So I, I think that one of the cardinal reasons for which, uh, uh, um, uh, what's it called, a, uh, a reshuffle should be occurring right now is essentially because it must echo the major policy shifts that are occurring uh, not just within the economy, but globally as well. And I think for that, I think there's been a large uh, deficit in that department. Okay. So you, you are yes to a reshuffle based on the current yes. conditions. Okay. Um, let me ask uh, Professor Bafoy Jibendria, is there a basis for reshuffle where we are currently, would you say? Please indulge me just for a minute okay. to say uh, how delighted I am to share this platform with people who I do respect very much, Franklin over the Kodium PNN and Alex. Uh, so it's great to be with you guys. Now to your question, uh, Evans, there is an important concept in governance with, uh, which uh, within political science they call political efficacy. That refers to the responsiveness of leadership or government to the demands of citizens. It's as simple as that. I can tell you that for this republic, and I've been a close observer of the Fourth Republic, I've never observed any moment in any government's life where there is an overwhelming public sentiment in favor of reshuffle. That in itself 
indicates very strongly that despite what the president thinks or says, the public demands a reshuffle. As simple as that. So that, that's an interesting take. So, the, so you're, this is the government uh, of the people, by the people. For this. So when the people say they want it, you give them. Precisely. Okay. The, okay. Democracy, the democracy that we, are, we cherish. This is a okay. perfect example of what it should be. That's that's an interesting one. Okay, let me bring in um, I, let me bring in Alessegbefia Senior um, when it comes to being the chief of staff, uh, Mr. Kujopini. I'm grateful that you could join us. I, the same question to you. Um, obviously, you have a very unique perspective to this conversation. You've you've wielded the gavel, so to speak, um, under the leadership of the former president Kufo. Uh, you reshuffled many many times. If you look at the current circumstances, would you agree that there is a basis for a reshuffle? Um, for, forgive me, forgive me, Mr. Kojopini. There's uh, you will please kindly unmute for me. On uh, please kindly unmute for me. Yes, I think I can hear you. You can hear me now. Yes, I can hear loud and clear. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Well, what, what do we want the reshuffle to achieve? Maybe that's the first thing we have to look at. Okay. And let's bear in mind that reshuffle per se may not change the situation you want to change. You want to reshuffle, and why do you want to do that? Is it because those who are in there are not doing their work well, and therefore you want to change them? Or you want to do it for the sake of reshuffle? You may do that, but you may not achieve any results. Okay, that's it's true that the people are pushing you or asking you to do the reshuffle. But the president is the sales in football, the coach. He selects his team, he watches them, and as they play the football, he decides who should be in and who should be out. If the coach believes that what those who are in are doing well, well, it's left for the coach to allow them to stay in. But the coach should know the consequences of his actions. In football, coaches lose their work frequently, simply because they don't do the right thing. So if the, if, if, if the coach believes that the team he has is the best, who am I sitting outside to say that he hasn't got the best team? So that's the way I look at it. It is the responsibility of the coach to look at his team, listen also to people who work with the team, and then take action on that. So this is what I can say now okay. about whether it should be a reshuffle or not. That, that's an interesting point. So it, it's about the, whose prerogative it is. And you, you have to leave the person. I almost hear you say, let the person make that decision and he will live or die by the decision he makes, whether to reshuffle or not. That's exactly what happens to coaches. Okay. That's exactly what happens to coaches. And therefore, in football, you have to see that you have big turnover of coaches. Because the people you are... You put in the team, the people are watching you. They may ask you to change some, some people you think you know better than them, and therefore you keep them. But in the end, your results will determine whether your decision is right or wrong. Okay. St stay with me, uh, Mr. Pini, because I'll return to you and ask you what factors would you, do you normally look at when your time you are doing reshuffles and see whether that will apply to all governments. And I will draw on the governance lessons there. But Alex Tegbefia, same question to you. Uh, should I take it for granted that you are, you are a yes to a reshuffle? As a citizen of Ghana, yes. As a politician, no. Okay. Because if Please he doesn't explain. do it, it actually, actually helps us because basically it's an unpopular decision not to reshuffle. So from where I'm sitting, if I was talking as a citizen of Ghana, and looking at what is happening, yes, he, I mean, everybody is saying it, he must reshuffle. And the reason is that it gives hope. It gives hope to the citizenry, it gives hope to the people who, have, who need jobs, they feel that there's a new face. We have a, a presidency that doesn't change except through elections. So to create that hope, uh, what the president has as a tool is to reshuffle people in a way which then gives 
uh, the idea that there's a new flavor, a fresh start with others. And that is what people look for. Your donor partners will be looking to see what you can do. There's even, you have a situation where we have an economic crisis. You're sending the same people who created the economic crisis into the same negotiations with the IMF. And some people think that that is actually not the best strategy. He believes he is the best strategy. And I agree with my senior, good evening to Kodjo Impianim. It's his prerogative. But uh, and at the end of the day, from a political standpoint of view, go ahead, Mr. President. But like uh, Mr. Bafois has said, Professor Bafois has said, the, the statistics are not showing that this is the way uh, Ghanaians are thinking. And from a political standpoint of view, uh, the coach has definitely got it wrong. Okay. Now, now let's go to the substance. Everybody has had a reason for their decision whether to agree with the reshuffle. Yours, I believe, was hinged on the current economic, socioeconomic circumstances. Am I accurate? Well, mostly. Okay. Um, and when I talk about major policy shifts, you see, um, while I agree that the, I mean, the coach determines what team he assembles, uh, in this case, uh, my answer is actually twofold. Yes, for certain uh, actors within the economy that have vowed never to go to the IMF, when the signs were quite glaring, uh, I thought that there should be some significant change in that department, based on their own words, really, and that they could, do, they could do what they thought they could do, but they couldn't eventually had to make a major U-turn to the IMF. But a part of me also feels that the kinds of reshuffling we, are, we, we may be talking about has to do with a root and stem approach. Really. Okay. And so what are we looking at? I mean, we thought that, for instance, the government should start reordering its expenditure patterns not just some haircut, as we have seen so far, the 30 or so called percentage uh, cut in, in, in expenditure, was going to give us close to about 200 million Ghana cities. When natural fact, discretionary spending could be cut by almost 6 billion Ghana cities. Mm. There are some of the analysis we've done. Now, if we did that, what it means is that you're actually taking a root and branch, uh, what's it called, a, a root and branch approach to dealing with the matter of, uh, of the size of the economy. So the reshuffling here could be policy-led, as well as personnel-led as well. And I think that if we are taking a cursory look at the numbers and the kinds of cuts that we, we wanted to see, um, major cuts would therefore lead to a rationalization of the ministries that we have. I mean, from 86, we could as well do about 40, really. There can be still stiffer realignment if the president wanted. But the president is an expansionary thinker. He thinks in bigger things. And so we may not necessarily have to quarrel with that. But if I were looking at the numbers, my reshuffling is not necessarily about just changing or reordering personnel. It's actually cutting the size of government to fit exactly what the economy is actually looking like right now. As I'm saying, if you took six billion, if you took a scapel and cut six billion of discretionary spending, you're actually going to cut a number of the ministries away and that will force a realignment or rationalization of these ministries. So these persons may find themselves in other departments or they may just be chucked out of the system entirely. Mm. So my reshuffling is actually in twofold. One, that deals with the department that said we're not, never going to go to the IMF, when indeed the numbers were showing clearly. But a larger reshuffle would mean for me one that accompanies deeper cuts. And okay. deeper cuts should lead the reshuffling. The reshuffling is not just in terms of personnel, but in terms of the re other reconfiguration of government, uh, what is called the gov government system that we have right now. Okay, so that's an so interesting we, thing. So uh, in real terms, you're talking about one, definitely bring some new, um, new hands on deck at the finance ministry. Well, possibly. Okay, yes. and then reduce the number of the ministers you have. Well, reduce the number of the ministers you have. I mean, that could, could be forced if you were indeed intent on really listening to what Ghanaians are saying about yeah. reducing the size of government. Yeah. And I'm saying that that can be addressed or traced to the fact that we have an expansionary government in terms of the fiscal exposures that we have for them. And so if we did a real, if we really wanted to do a real reshuffle, what it means is that we may actually end up re rationalizing or reordering the ministries we have Mm -hmm. and cut them from the current 86 ministers to in the region 40. only fits into about 40. Okay, I see. So that will necessarily come with change of personnel too, because once well, people are, you cut almost half, so they, you know, those are not I've there anymore. I've always said something in this country. I mean, in the far, far advanced countries, when the president falls sick, 
you see the effect immediately in the number. The stock prices change, right? Yeah. When the minister gets shifted in this administration, or when ministries, I mean, when many public servants really do not work, you probably do not see the, especially except for those who work in maybe the hospitals or public institutions that are very critical. A lot of them really, if they were not at work, I don't think there'll be any significant difference in the nature of the economy. I mean, we only see the impact uh. dramatically. It's the same way for our ministries. There are too many of them. There are too many ministries that could be collapsed into, you know, fit-sized ministries and then just have agency heads that could do their work. And I'm saying that if we did that, would have saved this economy, at least in these critical times, 6 billion Ghana cities and not 200 million cities that we are doing right now. Okay. By the cuts that we are seeing. Okay, I see the point because normally when you say reshuffle, for people think about personnel change. That's the point. Okay. You say go I mean, beyond that. The presidential that. system really, I mean, yeah. the president is the king. Yeah. And probably he's also quite careful uh, the time it may take in order for the ministers to be vetted and, uh, and approved in parliament. Yeah, that's a very important point. In a time of crisis... In a time of crisis, you don't want to do something like that. Okay. It may also show weakness. That's an important, but, but that's see, an important point. The, 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 what I'm trying to... Uh, I mean, what I'm suggesting is that given the critical moment we find ourselves, given, largely because of the structural nature of our economy, we could do a lot without a lot of the ministries, really. Okay. If we're intent on... You yeah. know, cutting our coat according to our, our side. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's an important, but let me bring in um, uh, Kojo Pining on, on the back of that. Mr. Pining, so he raises very interesting points that go beyond just personal change. Let me ask you, when you were the chief of staff, what factors would, um, would inform what broad governance, political, socioeconomic, help us walk, th walk us through what typically will inform a reshuffle at the presidency. And I, I must recall, you did a lot in your two terms. I mean, when you were there, I mean, you were there for a while. When you were there, you supervised a bit of the reshuffle. What, what are the factors that not, you know, normally influence the reshuffle? Yeah, as, as I stated earlier, the president is the coach. And he watches, listens to his people, he works with them. <coughs> Excuse me. And therefore, he must be able to determine whether they are doing well or not. Okay. Apart from this, within the system when I was there, we have uh, a unit called PC Policy Coordination uh, Management and Evaluation Department within the, 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 the presidency. And it's the, it was that duty to work with the ministers and report to the president through the chief of staff. So that the president was very much aware of what was going on within the ministries, whether the ministries, ministers were doing the right things or not. And in some cases, he would invite ministers, discuss issues with them. He attends uh, uh, cabinet meetings with them. Their contributions at the cabinet meetings, you could realize that maybe you put somebody at position A, but his contributions will tell you that he may be better if we shift him to, say, position B. The president looks at all these things with the support of the unit within the, 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 his, uh, of, within the castle at that time. And then decisions are taken based on the performance of these ministers. So it wasn't just like because uh, maybe the, the rank and file of the party or the full soldiers, as we call them, want a reshuffle, and therefore there must be a reshuffle. But the president studies his people. He must do that. If you're a president and you want to be successful, that's what you must do. Call them, correct them, if you think they are going wrong. If you realize that there's nothing that person can do, just call the person and thank you for what you have done to me, for me so far. I think it's about time for you to go. I wish you well. And this was the way... I, see, I saw when I worked with President Kufo, and I believe this may be the, 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 the right thing which must be done within a presidential or any government. If, you, if, if the president is not, on, is, is not hands on and leaves things for others to do, the president would never know what is happening within his government. And therefore, there will always be difficulties within the government. That, but the president must be hands on. You must see what they are doing, talk to them, invite them individually at cabinet meetings, allow them to speak. 
let everybody come to his contribution. You know the contribution of your ministers. You'll be able to determine who are good and who are not. And then you have this unit within the department, which, within the casting, which worked with the ministers, with the ministries, both the ministers and the officers who worked with the, with the ministers. And they reported to the president to enable the president to know what was happening within his government. So this was what we did. And this was what helped the pre president go for in his administration. The, the one thing I've heard you emphasize in this is the, 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 the overriding consideration is performance of the minister. That is right. Okay. That is right. Don't, don't forget that you are the president who have been given the executive power to rule the country. Success or failure is on you, not on any minister. They don't talk of minister, uh, uh, health minister's government. They talk of Kufo's government. So the success or failure is on you. And therefore, you must be conscious of what is happening within your government and take necessary action to make sure that you succeed. Okay. H to, to what extent does the general social economic circumstance of the people um, influence that decision? So finance, agriculture, trade and industry, all those things that affect people's bread and butter. I mean, and I know Kufo was famous for saying he was sitting in Abapa. In that, he's telling you it is about the living conditions of the people primarily. To what extent does all that influence that decision to reshuffle or not? Of course, you have voted to do that. You have voted because of the people. That's why they voted for you. And therefore, that must, must be your concern. If the people are not happy, if there are difficulties in the country, it's you, no, no other person but you. And therefore, that must be the most important thing in determining who should work, who should stay, and who shouldn't stay. They are helping you. All of them are helping you. So if that person is not performing well, you must be bold enough to tell the person, thank you so much, go away. You are primarily there because the people want you to improve their condition. And if you are not able to do that, you have failed. Let me ask you a final question before I bring Alex in into this. So where we, and I like the socioeconomic argument you've just introduced, which is the fundamental basis, because that's what you're employed to do. Well, we, know, we all know where we are as a country, socioeconomic, and the president has admitted, the current president has admitted the challenges are there, but he has a verdict on the ministers. He says they've been, quote, outstanding. Do you agree with him? Well, that is his verdict. Maybe if I were there, my verdict may be different. Or let me put it this way. Outside and look at what is happening, I think I'll have a different verdict. But as I started with, he's the coach. Maybe he sees what I don't see. But if he wants success, then maybe he should listen to people also, not only what he sees. But he must also consult, listen to others, for him to understand why some people are saying that maybe Mr. or Miss A or Madam A must be removed. They may have a reason. At times, it may not even be to performance. It may be even behavior of the person. And therefore, as a president, apart from looking at your own people, you must also listen to some people. I'm not saying that you always listen to people before you take decisions. No. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that open your eyes, open your ears, and let these things help you in determination of who you believe can help you better. Uh, let me bring Alex. Alex, I, I brought you into the conversation for a good reason. Apart from the fact that you've been very close to the president before as a chief of staff, you were also in government when we had a crisis in the 2014, 2015, that period when we were having doom so. And it's fact that John Mahama then, and, and the power and energy ministry was where the problem fundamentally was, Doomso was running. He actually did something where he changed the portfolio of um, the energy minister then, and then he brought in somebody else in the, in the passing of, if you remember, Dr. Um, the former boss boss is currently the, in, in parliament, your good friend, um, just name escaped me a bit. And he became the... Exactly. He became the prime minister. He was taxed with the mandate of fixing the crisis. 
And Kamala Nanko then resigns down the line, and his public statement was linked to his decision. He came to solve the problem. He believed either the problem was solved or not. He thought it was time to go by himself. But what happened was there was a change at the anchor ministry that had responsibility for fixing the crisis. Um, if you what walk me through, and if you possible, you were in cabinet, and I, was, was it a time you were the health minister? Um, yes. Good. Um, at, the, at the last part, yes, I was health minister at the time. Yeah, so, so now right. we have an economic crisis. We have an, a, a ministry that is anchor ministry supervising that crisis. Compare and contrast both periods and tell me what, what, was, what was the considerations in that decision and how does that reflect on what we are seeing now? Well, as has been said, one of the things, and I like the way uh, Franklin used very good scientific basis for uh, a president to look at when he wants to do a reshuffle. And that, hasn't, that is more without looking at the social uh, economic type scenarios that the every, every, everybody is feeling at any given time. His was very scientific. You look at uh, a, a, a reshuffle based on what has happened and you, you then look at the reshuffle because for some of us, even when you talk of a reshuffle, even the size of governments at the presidency or, and the budget for the presidency is to be looked at because you're bleeding and you have to actually see ways of uh, cuts, as Franklin has said. But at the end of the day, um, as uh, our senior Kudrin Piedim has indicated, you are responsible for the country. And you one of the things we want to get from you as a president is hope that things can change, especially in times of crisis. And they have been, the indicators have been there for a while. And you may have been listening to your ministers and they said, look, we can, we can weather this storm. We can weather this storm. Let's, let's keep going. And you now have a situation where even three days before you decide to make this major decision to go to the IMF, the ministers are saying, we're not going. We're not going. And then we go. And then the same ministers are now going to go into a negotiation. So when Franklin hones in on the Ministry of Finance, I can relate to that. Okay. Because everybody is kind of like, okay, it's clear that he's not happy with where we are now because he would rather have not gone. But there appear to be some pressure brought to bear which has made us go in that direction. So is he the right person, even to the common layman, put out the, the, scientific, the common layman, is he the right person to be negotiating on our behalf? in an area that he's not happy with. And those are the kind of considerations. Kwamna Donko made a, 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 a statement. He said, look, I want to do this within a year. If I don't finish within a year, I'll resign. Yeah. The year came up. He had done 97% of the job. If you want to be even difficult, say 95. There was 5% just left needs and business. On principle, and because he had said it, he had to resign. Yeah. Now, that, for me, is the mark of a man. I gave a promise. I said I'll do it. I wasn't able to do it. I've resigned. He made the job easier for the president. But he didn't bring the whole governance down with him by sticking to his look, it's only 5%, we will sort this out. In the next six months, everything will be fine. He gave us credibility by stepping down. And he lives to fight another day. He's in parliament, and who knows what tomorrow will bring him. So the fact that he had to resign then, it's not the end of the world. But here we are in a really serious major crisis. And it is not funny. And when you hear statements like, look, this my people are, have done the best. They are, these are the best crop of people. Yeah. When all the economic indicators and all kinds of uh, indicators you have are telling us to something totally different, different, is every single thing, just COVID and the Ukraine war, something is not right. But like I said, 
from a political point of view, we would say he can still remain stubborn because that's what for me it is. I'm going to stick with my people. I'm going to be stubborn about it. Exactly the same way the finance minister was stubborn with the issue of IMF, and now we are here. Uh, so, say, uh -huh. yeah, go ahead. I mean, let me bring Professor Wafaj Mendria. Very interesting perspectives there. But I wonder, um, I, I get a sense that there isn't a, a magic bullet when it comes to reshuffle as a tool to fix a government that is non-performing. So I ask the question as a governance uh, uh, expert. Is there a correlation between a government's ability to reshuffle at the right time and bring fresh people in and that government's ability to deliver good governance to its people? I don't see that correlation at all. Okay. Because here we're talking, we don't forget the element of competence on the part of those who are appointed. You see? So reshuffling by itself will not bring you anything unless you are willing to bring the person who commands first the respect of the people, but more importantly, somebody who has demonstrated competence in the area. But you see, there is also the political consideration of restructuring. Like I said from the beginning, in our democracy, when a lot of people are you know, raising their voices for that, then I think uh, political efficacy should prevail. But having said that, I think I want to attach myself a bit to what uh, Franklin said. And it's an important part because reshuffling by itself will not make any difference. Besides having the competent people to rule, but in the present situation, we should also be looking at how we cut down expenditures. Uh -huh. That is very important. But again, the problem is that the Constitution permits a president to create ministries at will. After all, the Constitution says 19. But beyond that, a president can go as far as around 20, as we saw not too long ago. So it brings into focus the real need for reforms that will restructure the power relations between the executive and citizens. And I think once the pre any president holds the kinds of powers that the constitution provides now, it's going to be difficult oftentimes for the president to be responsive to the demands of citizens. So from the governance perspective, I have a problem with the way we have structured our governance and the way somehow we have even created an imperial presidency for ourselves. And therefore, any president, <laughs> there's a popular saying by somebody I know very well. He says that our constitution gives too much power for a good president to have. And uh, and for, no, too much power for a good president to need, but for a bad president to have, you see? So if you have a president who is not willing to be responsive, there's nothing much you can do about that. So in terms of reshuffling, simply put, by itself, it won't make any difference. But in our present crisis, I think what we have to be looking at is how we expand this whole concept of reshuffling to the size of governance. Because we are talking about economic uh, uh, difficulties here. And then I think Alex also made a very important point, which is when Dr. Kobranonko decided on his own to withdraw as a matter of principle. Because I tend to say that our political culture does not in a way permit appointees to voluntarily resign to make it easy for presidents. Mm. You understand? Because in this case, where somebody has sworn that <laughs> I'm not going to go there, to the very last minute, you go there, and it's the same person who's going to lead the negotiations. And it's not only the finance minister. I think the in the public uh, perception, there are a few others 
who they think uh, their performance has not been up to par and therefore must be reshuffled. But such individuals, I think, should make it easier for any president by simply withdrawing. But we don't have that culture very much ingrained in our system. So simply put, I'm saying that. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, <laughs> if the president is serious and is interested in getting uh, uh, his party to break the eight, as I keep hearing, then maybe you should be looking at what I call earlier as political efficacy, in other words, being responsive to the popular uh, cry of people for the change. And as I said, frankly, over the past 30 years, I haven't seen any occasion where there is this kind of groundswell of uh, public sentiments for, for some changes in government. Now, the president gave an explanation for why he doesn't want to change, and it's an economic explanation. And I, I want to run it by uh, Franklin, because Franklin brought in the economic angle. His explanation is, frankly, that the same crop of um, ministers he has were the same crop of ministers who helped him come out of the last IMF program in 2017, uh, when, they, when they came into power. I mean, prematurely. Yeah, exactly. Because, well, but, because but they decided to come. To, to leave. But, but for, for some reason, he says he believes that they were there, they helped him 2017, 2018, 2019, they were out. So they have an experience in exiting an IMF program. Now that he's going to an IMF program, he makes this explanation that interview he did this week where he said they were outstanding. He says, why do I have to change them? That crop of people know how to exit. So he needs them to do the turn around again in the next two and a half years. And remember that the finance minister had put the timeline to economic recovery to two and a half years. Does it not make sense? That's quite ambitious, by the way. But let me just say one thing, that the, the, there wasn't uh, a uni universal exit. I think it was just the government that decided to exit based upon certain promises they made to the IMF at the time. And of all the 11 or so structural reforms that they said they were going to accede to, only two were, were actually uh, done, but done with significant delays, mm -hmm. to speak. Nine out of those transformational benchmarks have not been met. I mean, they told the IMF at the time, in 2019, that they were going to get significant revenues from Sino Hydro. Our oil was going to hit a million barrels per day. We are doing, right now, we are doing barely 200,000, right? Sino Hydro hasn't come fully on stream. We said we're going to uh, rationalize wage, wage, wages as well. So expenditure on wages, we're going to rationalize. We didn't do that. So we made promises to the IMF that we didn't keep. So it was not a universal acceptance of an exit. It was the government decision to exit. Partly the reasons why we are in this hole again. Because once the IMF exited, it gave the room to splurge. A ministry like Ministry of Special Development Initiative should never have occurred under this administration. Mm. So that singular ministry has been responsible for a lot of the chaos in policy making and the waste we see today. So if the president said these persons helped him to exit the IMF, he did so upon the promise that was not kept. Structural reforms, as I said, 11, only two were met with significant delays. And then the promise made to the IMF that they will keep wages, uh, public sector wages low and all of that had not come to fruition, that they were going to raise revenues as well has not come to fruition. So uh, I just wanted to point to a check on that particular, uh, for lack of a better word, boost, that mm -hmm. these men were the same persons who helped him. Well, they exited prematurely. And that's why we are here, that's why we are where we are today. You see, the assessment of government essentially is, 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 a, is, is an am am amalgam of a number of factors. The effectiveness of the management, transparency, how socially inclusive the decisions they make would be, and then, of course, innovation, and maybe transparency as well. Mm. I mean, if I were going to raid this government based on these pillars, I would definitely defer to international indices, right? Even though we have our local indices. Sometimes, once we do not respect international indices, we tend to see the results play out in, in, locally. Yeah. So take transparency, for instance. I don't think we've done fairly well on the Global Transparency Index, right? Yeah. Innovation, 2019, we were 106. 20, 2018, we were, 2019, we were 106. 20, uh, 2020, we were 108. And 2021, we were 112 out of 127 countries. So innovation is an amalgam of trade, communications, and 
maybe some other ministry that believes that they are, they are being enterprising when it comes to innovation. Mm. So that's why I'm saying that if you are really interested in enhancing government effectiveness, you need an amalgam of international indices plus your own local indices that we do. I mean, the CDD does this Afrobarometer. It's a reflection, it's a, it's a mirror per se. Uh, we used to have the inspirational, inspirational Public Sector Leadership Awards, which usually measures innovation or measures, we choose a theme each year. But the whole idea was to help with the reform efforts. What I'm trying to submit to you is that if you really want to say that we've done quite well, you should be benchmarking yourself against some of these international indices, as well as some of the, of course, international indices. Then we can have a perfect conversation about how effective your governance has been. That's what I'm saying that if I look at the, even let's take just the economic factor. I don't think the president is not aware that we've run a very bloated administration. Well, his administration has been quite bloated, right? And has been quite wasteful in that regard as well. If you look at the procurement infractions that we have, the fiscal irregularities that we've had over the last five years or so, it's actually dwarfed the ones we assessed under Mahama. Between 2010 and 2014, fiscal irregularities for MDAs totaled only 1.3 billion Ghana cities. By 2021, we're heading to almost 13 billion Ghana cities. That's 13 fold. So if I want to assess the size of government or if I want to say that the government has done quite well, I need to look at these numbers and say that, look, whereas internationally, the transparency indices are saying that I'm not doing well on corruption, there are local leagues like the Fiscal Recklessness Index, which is showing you that you've actually been fiscally reckless over the last five years, 13 times more than your predecessor. So when I say that the way to talk about this reshuffle thing is to really look at the effectiveness of government and in a crisis situation, take a holistic approach and decide. Of course, in the presidential system, I'm not, I'm not sure this will happen overnight, but that's the way I would do it. That if I'm in a crisis situation and I want to really appeal to international uh, actors in the economy, I think the best thing I need to do is to effectively cut sincerely cut discretionary spending. And the bill on the table is six billion, not yeah. 220 million, yeah. right? Once you do that, you are actually signaling to the people, and including the IMF, because trust me, I'm not too sure the IMF is overly convinced yeah. by our steps. We are not even clear what we want, right? I think the figure is now 1.5 billion, now it's 3 billion. But beyond that, we need real structural reforms. And part of it, apart from the economy, that needs to be restructured. That may take some time. Mm. As we speak right now, one of the major bleeding points is our waste in the public system. Six billion out of discretionary spending can signal to the market that these guys are already in business. And maybe we can begin to have a conversation you, you, about You know, you, you, say, you say all that, and I, I struggle to see... So the president doesn't know... Obviously he does. But... Isn't there an argument, and, and, and I hear Professor Balfour just say, a, a mere reshuffle of changing personnel might not achieve much. But, um, Prof, I need, to, I need to come back on that based on what I've heard, that it's so obvious on the face of, of this that everybody agrees a lot has gone wrong. Um, if you change the people, and he's talking about six billion, just make the cut, but they aren't cutting. They aren't cutting enough. Well, they've said they've cut a, 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 20 billion and then 25 percent. Well, that was 40 billion, yes. 40 million, and then 80 million along the way. I mean, if we combine the those uh, cuts from the yes, it four, so they've done the cuts. Some of the cuts, but the cuts do not go deeper. Either. Okay. So my yeah. question, my question, it revolves around: Is it possible that they, because the indiv individuals who have been in charge have been there for so long, sometimes you get blind? You know how you are typing, you're writing, you make a mistake unless. A second person has a second eye on it. You never spot a very obvious mistake in what you're doing, and you need a second eye. Isn't there that argument then? And I'm coming back to the point that Prof. Prof. Um, Bafo Jumandua makes about that's why you needed an assessor general within the cabinet, because an assessor general of but they had that. They had that in the monitoring evaluation ministry. That's the point. It's a pity that that, that has been scrapped. That ministry was scrapped. But the point I'm making is that even that you should have someone like a cabinet level, some sort of an assessor general, who has the you know the gravitas to actually call people, call call for papers, call for audits, and then just at the cabinet level can be telling the president, and this is what we want. I think this president is a is a really conservative president, 
uh, in spite of the fact that it's working within the strictures of a, of a presidential system and doesn't want to rock the votes, I think he's, he, he needs to be moved beyond just the fact that we are all talking in the public square, that he, people need to be changed. I don't think he's getting the real picture from the persons closer to You think him. he's living the bubble? He's living in the bubble. He's lost touch with reality. I think so. Okay. Right. Let, let me ask that quickly. I'll take a bit, but I, I need to pick the thoughts of um, Kodiopin, and I'll come to Alex again on this question, because there are two politicians they've been there. I mean, Mr. Kodiopin, you've been there. Is it possible for a president to live in the bubble? And is that what possibly may be happening to Nana Rudankwa Kufuadu now? <laughs> uh, uh, this is a, a question. It's a difficult question for me to... I haven't seen... A, I have not been associated with a, a president who lives in a bubble. And uh, where well, maybe the possibility is there. I mean, former president, the government never lost touch with the reality, you say? If you're a president, you, are, you, you, you lose touch with the reality, then I, I'm afraid that that, that, that that will be your end. Because you don't know what's happening around you. You just don't know what is happening around you. And therefore, your usefulness to the state is then gone. <laughs> I, I haven't experienced that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And I, I really don't know if that's what is happening now. I, I can't really comment on what is happening <coughs> now because I'm not within the, 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 the governance cycle. So I, I can't comment on that. How much... Considering, and we're only having this conversation because we are in a non-presidented crisis. I mean, if you were the chief of staff in the midst of this crisis, what are some of the things you'd be, you, you will be advising your president to do? Like, uh, what is it? The gentleman said, you know... Mr. The, uh, Franklin Kujo. We are look at, yeah, Mr. Kujo, yeah. So we, are, we are looking at it that... Two issues involved here now. One is the cost of governance. And one is governance as we have it now. How do we repair whatever uh, uh, mistakes we have now? Yes, I agree with you that we should look, as a country, look at the cost of governance. Is it the best we can have? Not only now, but in future. So if all of us as a nation put our heads together and said, well, maybe we don't need so many ministries. And if we agree that we don't need so many ministries because it's just too expensive, then maybe we may come up with a law to say that we are limiting ourselves. Not, we should forget even the bad current president because we, it's already in there, but in future. So we are limiting ourselves to a certain number of ministries and we will not go beyond that. Then we'll be living within our means. I believe that's how we should look at it now. But now what we are looking at is the effectiveness of those who are in charge, especially the ministers who are helping the president. So we should look at that one now and decide, as we're trying to do now, whether they are really helping the president or not. Based, based on what you see as a Ghanaian yourself, and I know you have, everybody has relationships, would you, would you say they are, they are helping the president? Effectively? I believe, I believe sincerely, that some of them must go. Some of them must go. I've heard you but mention specifically the finance minister that if that the one, president... I didn't say I didn't say it should go. I said if, it I should offer. His, if I wear his position, I shouldn't wait for anybody to tell me to go, but I will resign myself. Yeah. Because this was something I was so much against. And telling the world, the world that we are a proud nation, we don't need to go to. IMF, three, four days after we are IMF. How am I going to face the IMF people to negotiate? So that's why I said, if I wear his position, I wouldn't wait for the president to tell me to go. But I would say, Mr. President, thank you. I don't think I believe in what you, executive, uh, executive authority, what you want us to do, and therefore I want to leave. I'm not asking him to go, but I say, if I wear his position, I will go myself. Mm. Do, do you think, and you're making a point about earlier about some of the ministers um, must uh, decide to step. But do you think beyond the finance minister taking that decision, do you think others in the government too must make the, a similar decision by themselves? 
You see, it's always difficult for somebody to come out to say that I'm not doing well, therefore I'm resigning. That one, I haven't heard it anywhere. <laughs> so if you want people to come out and say, oh, I'm not working well and therefore I want to resign, you may not have that. At that stage, you need a president to tell the person that, sorry, I don't think you are pulling your weight and therefore you must leave. At that stage, it's a responsibility of a president to do that. But for somebody to come to the president and say, Mr. President, I'm sorry, I've not been doing well. Uh, I, I'm not up to the work, up to the standard, and therefore I'm resigning. I, 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 I'm sorry, you wouldn't get anybody doing that. Having said that, would you then back the, uh, the, uh, the, the call for the president now to take that whip and reshuffle, take people out and bring fresh people in? I believe, you see, when I said, I said reshuffle per se may not solve everything. Mm -hmm. But if you are doing a reshuffle, then you are doing to bring in more competent people yeah. to help you achieve your targets. And that's why I would say, yes, if I were the president, I would do some changes. Okay. But unfortunately, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I need to ask you, what changes would you have done? Oh, I don't think it would be fair to me, for me to <laughs> sit here and start mentioning ministries and whatnot. No, I won't do that. Okay, great. I mean, but, but Alex, let me bring you on that, on that point. I, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a quick break, but I'll just quick, Alex, on, on that point there, um, that if people are not resigning, the president must crack the whip. Uh, you, you agree with that? Yes, and there's a statement you made which I don't agree with. Okay. And for his particular reason, you said everybody knows that everything is, is, is not good and everybody thinks that there are problems. I don't think the president thinks that because he has outstanding ministers and they've all done perfectly well. So he cannot, he's one person who definitely doesn't think uh, there's anything wrong or there's any issue because his ministers are outstanding. And that is part of the problem. You, 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 yes, you must defend your own, but the language doesn't give anybody any sense of hope or encouragement. If he had said, oh, look, we have challenges, um, and I know that they are, my ministers have been overwhelmed by the issues that have come up, but I know that I have a good team of people who are working. That's a different statement from saying I have out, they have been outstanding. I and mean, that I, I, Alex, Alex makes, you're, you're a politician, so I must ask you, is the president simply being a politician by having a public um, face to this? that is possibly different from what happens when he sits with his ministers in cabinet, that may be in cabinet, he's been tough on them and threatening, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, in public, he must show that he's in charge. And this is just public rhetoric. But I just made the same statement, but in a different set of words. Okay. I, I, there are ways of doing this. But when you go out and say they are outstanding, when people are actually struggling day to day, buying petrol, hustling, jobs are going, people's businesses are, are down, it shows no empathy whatsoever. Mm. And that is bad politics. Okay. But, I mean, that is where I'm coming from. And for me, uh, people will say that, look, there's this, there are, so, there, and there are other ministries. And we keep, we keep forgetting that we have the same faces and even when we, after the first four years, there was some reshuffle, some people kept their positions and are still in those positions. So you're having people who have been in place for five and a half years. And they, they are, some of those ministries are struggling, not just the finance ministry. And the entrances coming from some of the ministers have gotten to the stage of bordering on arrogance. So he should be alive to this and looking at it. And for some reason, and I say, look, that's fine. From a political standpoint of view, it's good for us in opposition. But it's not good for the country. We, he is president of the whole country, and he must look at some changes in the whole governance structure, in his, the, the, the expenditure bill, and where the monies are going, and a crackdown. And the, the, uh, uh, Professor Bafour, um, Franklin, and my good senior, Kodjo Impianin, are spot on. There are issues and he should address them. But we are not looking at an outstanding performance from a government. I mean, and, and the government is made up of 
of ministers. In touch on something, I quickly want to uh, uh, run by um, Mr. Kujopini because I feel it's unprecedented. I don't know what he thinks because he's been there before. Uh, Mr. Kujopini, does it surprise you that this is the president's sixth year in his second term and he hasn't done one single reshuffle? From my experience, yes, it surprises me. Okay. Why does that surprise because, you? Because, you know, you, 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 you're working with people from, you may not even know all of them to start with. Some of them might have been recommended to you. And if you are lucky, they come and work very well. And therefore, to think that all the 70 or 80 people are going to work very well to your satisfaction, to the extent that you don't think any of them, none of them, is working below par is something I find it difficult from my own experience working in government. That's why, that's why I'm surprised about that. Okay. I want to take a quick break. One return. So there's a consensus around the table that some change must happen. Franklin has been very clear where the changes should be. When I return, I'll, I'll ask the uh, Professor Bafoy Jimendria, Alex Sebafia, Dr. Kojo Pini. Kojo Pini has already suggested already that the finance minister should, should offer. Um, but apart from that, where else should the changes happen if there's going to be a change? Assuming the president changes his mind tomorrow, um, where should he look to trim? Stay with me after the break. We'll, we'll get it, we'll get that uh, uh, out of the way as we wrap up. Uh, we've been having a fascinating conversation about a, a very important aspect of governance that is rarely spoken of: uh, reshuffling a government. And we've had very interesting definitions of this. Beyond just personnel changes, it, it, it goes also to trimming a government uh, and and making policy changes as well. You don't only shuffle ministers, you shuffle ministries and you shuffle policy. And uh, frankly, has said that whole package must come together if you really want to achieve something more effective. So the question that remains is, I think there's an agreement that something has to change now. So where? Where do you make the changes? Um, I think on the, on the table is a consensus that the finance ministry is a place to start. But where else? Uh, Professor Bafoy Jimendria, um, if the president changes his mind tomorrow, where else should he, should he begin the change? From. In terms of dropping ministers, if you put your ears to the ground, what we hear popularly is uh, the health sector, that is the, the Minister of Health, as well as the Minister of Agric. This is what we hear. Okay? These three, these two together with the finance, I think are the prominent ones that we hear the public uh, you know, talking about. Then, of course, there are some ministers also that we don't even hear about at all. We don't know whether they are performing or they are not. Okay? Then also, we know that some ministers, uh, when they come to public, you can tell they are too tired, they're overwhelmed, and some have uh, health issues. So all these could be factors that I think, if the president wants to make a move, he can be taken uh, account of to, to, to inform his decision. I mean, Alex Sebefia, where else should he be cutting? Should he be looking to change if he changes his mind? The road ministry is a good point, place to start as well. Um, and uh, when, when you have a situation where you've had a year of roads and you've had uh, issues about the roads that have been constructed and you have this issue about toll boots being uh, closed without the right authority. Um, I think he's, he's, he's shaky. His ministry is one that uh, is shaky. And you have to, that'll have to be looked at. Um, mm. I don't want to go any further than the ones that have already Okay, called. mention. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not uh, the president, as Kojo uh, Mpini would say. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, my and that, senior... That's so let's, let's leave it at those yeah. that have been called. Let me bring in Franklin. Frankly, once upon a time, Imani had a report that came, that came out of Athlinks every year that did you know, an assessment of the ministries and rated them, etc. Um, you've given us a package of what a reshuffle should look like. If you're isolating it to ministries and ministers right now, apart from the finance ministry where you've been clear on, which other areas would you... And, and because you said now you have to reduce, which means some must go. 
completely. Any any key areas where you you think that act should fall? I mean, just look at the policy incoherence within the space. If you did within a few sectors, so why did we create MIF, the Mineral Investment Fund? to spend government royalties to set up an entity that should also be engaging in what they call uh, investing in gold assets and all of that, and not probably doing it quite well. I'm just seeing a report that I'm not too happy with. I think MIF was a creation that, even though maybe the intention is to purchase, invest in gold assets around the world, I think the vehicle they're adopting may become problematic because it's, it's, it still lacks a bit of transparency. Mm -hmm. Besides the fact that governments doing business in that enterprise um, and then listing and investing in offshore jurisdictions that are not too clear is a bit of a problem. Link that to a Japa. Um, what is this conversation about Ameri being moved to Kumasi and then the costing. the costing and all of that? I mean, who is supervising that? We need to have got some questions. I look at the agriculture's contribution to GDP and I'm seeing that doing, I mean, some I mean, the figures are dwindling, right? I mean, how much you spend uh, as per the Maputo Declaration is significantly low. Uh, we've done averagely 3.3% between 2001 and 20, 20, 2015. And between 2015 and 2020, we've done just about 2.2%. That's on the lower side. The health sector, I mean, wasn't it the health ministry that said they didn't have any reasons for which uh, reasons assigned to the the criteria for selecting the Agenda 111 um, hospitals. I mean, there are just so many policy issues within every ministry that if you give me an opportunity, and we have to rather do a rationalization rather than just charging out individuals, uh, really. Um, Mr. Kujopini, finally to you, um, with, I mean, I, I, and I know you are, beyond the fact that you were former chief of staff, you are an MPP person true and true. Um, and at, at the beginning, Professor Bafo Jumendria talks about if the party wants to break the aid, they have to do a few things. You've expressed your surprise about a few. Let me ask you broadly, this, apart from, we've talked a lot about what is in the best interest of this country. But if, even if you move away from that, and from, from and I'm asking you this as a politician, as an MPP, uh, stalwart and, and, and founding member, um, to, what, to, to what extent, is it good politics um, for this current government to take some of the steps you have recommended tonight that they take? How much of your fortunes in the next two and a half years will, will depend on the decisions that are taken today, either about reshuffling, reducing the size, cutting expenditure, or making some real tough decisions that President Kufour did, by the way, in 2021, 2001, when he came, took us to HIPEC and told us to buy the bullet. This is, I'm asking about the political implication of what is happening or what may not happen? You see, there is a saying that governments, opposition, opposition don't uh, win power. Governments lose power. Which, tell, which <coughs> tells us that the actions of the government will determine whether the government is going to continue in power or not. And therefore, as a a party man, as an MPP man, I must be concerned about actions of the, of, of the government. I must be concerned and look at whether the, the, some decisions and actions of government is, is in the interest of the party continuing to, to quote, to break the eight as we contemplate in doing. And therefore, I must as much as possible, speak out about some of these issues. But as you rightly said, you don't forget that I'm a, an, an NPP and a very active member of NPP. So there may be some issues like asking me who should minister should go or not, which I'm not prepared to sit on yeah. a, a television and tell the world that I believe Mr. A, Minister A or Mr. B, Mr. B should go. But if I have the opportunity to say to talk to the president, if I have the president, I will tell him why I think A should go. I'm not just going to say A should go, but I'll tell him why I believe A should go. And then it's left to him to decide whether what I'm telling him is, is true or not. And that's the only way 
doesn't have to take my word for it. I always advise you that after telling all these things, fortunately for you, have the security agencies working to you. You can ask the security agencies to investigate. And if you find out that what I'm saying is true, please act on it. If you find out that I'm lying to you, call me and tell me whatever you want to tell me that I should not be doing that again. Mm. But I believe I must be concerned about the actions of the government if I believe and if I think we should continue in power. That is very important as a party man. Mm. So I, because I don't want this to lose power. But if government does not, if at the end of it, the actions and operations of government is not something majority of the populace is enthused with, of course, then they're going to vote us out of power. Um, <clears throat> Alex, let me ask you that political question finally. In, the president, in their reaction to the cost to, to um, reshuffle, mentioned the NDC by name and said, those calls coming from the NDC is meant to destabilize his government. Your reaction? Well, historically, anything the NDC says, he tries not to do. So, um, especially if John Mahama is the one who has said it. So I'm clear in my mind that there won't be any reshuffle soon. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's almost and as if, if you, if you want him not to do something. Exactly. Let the NDC say it. Then you say it. <laughs> I see. And, and, and nothing will happen. Once, I mean, why did we drag the IMF thing so long? We have said go to the IMF early. When the interest rates and the inflation rates were lower and you were, your, your debt to GDP was still not, and you could actually have a better negotiation a year ago, then you wait a whole year and do it. Why? Because the NDC said so. Well, we begin to think so. It may not be that reason, but it was a contributory factor. So we know for a fact that he, if he, he, once we have said it, he will feel that we are trying to destabilize his government. But when, they, when you're in opposition, and when they were, they were able to say all manner of things to us. Some we took on board, some we didn't. So I, don't, I think that is more, like you said, it's more political rhetoric. He also said, I mean, how many jobs does he have as a minister? For him to decide that all the people on the MPP who are talking about his uh, ministers wanted for jobs. How, if he, he, he reshuffled, how many of them are going to even get the jobs he's talking about? So for in reality, um, the excuses he gave are political. Uh, uh, some of them are just political talk. But the one that really uh, doesn't go well is when he, he marks his people as outstanding. That, for me, is a bit far-fetched. And uh, he could have done a lot better than that. Professor uh, Bafojiman, the governance question uh, for you last be before we wrap up. Um, we've talked about reshuffle. We've looked at it in many, many ways. But at the beginning, you touched on there's, there's a constitutional issue also here. The president has the prerogative and to do this if he wants or not. But then he also has, you know, the latitude in the constitution to appoint as many people as he wants. Going forward on a more substantive basis, if, if we want this problem that we quite talked about and we, everybody's saying cut and trim, should we be considering far-reaching reforms um, at the governance constitutional level uh, that, that may, down the line, impact what a president can and cannot do in times of crisis like this? Oh, sir, man. So I've been one person who's been calling for reforms of the constitution because in my view, most of the difficulties we face within our governance system is because of the way the Constitution has structured governance. There's no doubt about that. I referred to earlier uh, as we having an imperial president, uh, little constraints and all. Look, any president of this country can go to bed tonight, wake up the next morning, and create a ministry. It doesn't have to go to parliament without regard to the financial implications of such creations. Over the years, so many state agencies have been created. They are all required, they all require some budget outlays. So when Franklin is talking about cutting down the size of government, I believe, and I, did, I think he did mention, not only ministries, 
Yeah. But state agencies. Yeah. Okay. So as for reform, it's something we need. It's about time we focus seriously on reforming our constitution to ensure that governance becomes very transparent, that a, a president doesn't go to bed and wake up the next morning and create any institution he wants. There should be checks on all these kind of things. So if you ask me uh, going forward, certainly that should be high on the agenda of the country. Mm. Finally, uh, fr yes. uh, Evans, yes. uh, this question about the president being a bubble or, or not. Look, yeah. if you look at the system of governance, every president is briefed every morning, unless, of course, you have very porous uh, intelligence uh, agencies. I believe that the president knows exactly what is going on in this country because he's expected to be briefed every morning on what has transpired the previous night. Okay? So in that respect, it would be hard for me to believe that a president will live in a bubble. He's exposed to so many things you and I will never be exposed to. But if the president chooses to disregard, or unless you argue that his people are misinforming him, and based on that, he's making the wrong choices. That's a different argument. Mm. Otherwise, I cannot see how a president can be in a bubble. Okay. Lord the Bafo Ejimendi, I'm grateful. Uh, frankly, I'm grateful. Are we going to see a report soon on the ministries and assessment? Well, we need it now more than ever before. Possibly. Okay. Uh, but now that the president has given a verdict, verdict. I wonder how we can match up. Okay. Frankly, who is president of Imani? Um, um, Alex Egbefia is a former deputy chief of staff, for, former health minister, and Kojo Pirim, who is a former chief of staff himself. I'm grateful, gentlemen, for joining me on PMS. Enjoy the rest of February.